you're going to see a quick, quick clip, and we're going to dive right into the message. <clears throat> and you know, I say every year that churches like ours are some of the most important participants in pride, certainly the most subversive. And I think we know why. For the Christian tradition and the Holy Bible have all too often been used by church people, by congregations, as weapons against LGBTQIA people to marginalize, to demonize, and to exclude. And this is wrong on every level imaginable. First and foremost, because it is just plain cruel. It's behavior that diminishes us all. But also, because I would argue that this is actually contrary to the Christian faith. This is contrary to the overarching witness of the Bible. Sure, 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 you can take a verse of Scripture out of context and make it say whatever you want it to say. Which leads me to our very interesting reading today from the Acts of the Apostles, a reading that is popular amongst queer theologians in the church. For here we have the deacon Philip being led by the Spirit of God to have an encounter with an Ethiopian eunuch. Led Inclusivity is a fruit of the Spirit of God. And we can see that in our reading today from Acts. For Philip is led by the Spirit to have an encounter with an outsider of outsiders. For here we have an African. This is the first instance, by the way, of an African being baptized in the Bible who lives far from Jerusalem, a Gentile, and a sexual minority a non-binary person of his day. And some scholars have argued that the Greek word that is translated into the English word eunuch actually implies a greater spectrum of identity than that word might mean to us today. So here we have, friends, a queer person of color, and the Spirit of God leads Philip to have an encounter with them. That's the crap I'm going after today. <laughs> now, uh, we're back in First Kings. We haven't been there uh, since October 8th, 2023. We left off there actually with the downfall uh, of King Solomon. If you recall that in First Kings chapter 11, Solomon's death was 932 BC, and since then, the northern kingdom, uh, remember there was a split, so it was all one nation of Israel, then because of Solomon's sin, it split. The northern kingdom with 11 tribes and Judah with one, actually it was the northern with um, 10 per se, because Benjamin was in the middle of Judah, was the southern kingdom. Our character that we're dealing with here, Elijah, is from the northern kingdom. And for about 60 years, from the time of Solomon's downfall to, to where our text is in 1 Kings 17, there was seven consecutive evil kings that was ruling the northern kingdom. <clears throat> When Elijah is introduced here in 1 Kings 17, the king is Ahab, and Jezebel is the queen. It's no doubt that Ahab was the worst, the most evil king in the northern kingdom. Here's what the scripture says about him in 1 Kings 16. Verse 29 through 33, listen to this. In the 38th year of Asaph, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 
seven, uh, sorry, 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. I, I just love the language. Listen to this. And, it's, and as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. In other words, that's one bad thing. But he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the uh, Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. That's the commentary on Ahab. Those days, unfortunately, I believe have become these days. In, in, in this case for Israel, for the first time in their history, they become a plural, pluralistic society where they're now being led to worship more gods than the one God, Jehovah. They're led into a pluralistic worship, given unto one or to multiple called Baal. Oftentimes when we read Baal, we think Baal is, is one God, but actually Baal is just a title. There was multiple Baals and each region, whether it be the Philistines, whether it be Sidonians, they all had their own Baal. Each region had a Baal. But there was hundreds of Baals. There was the Baal of fertility. So you went to that Baal if you wanted to have children. There was the Baal of medicine. There was the Baal of harvest. There was the Baal of business success. Particularly to our story for Elijah, he's going to address uh, the Baal that kind of controlled nature, which dealt with, with the rains for the crops, etc. Now, what we're going to look at is what Elijah did to address the downfall of the nation. And what I'm going to look at is what I think is the idolatry that's affected us. I'm just going to remind you, I, I am in a very good mood. I really am. It's been a great life. Have a great life. You're a great church. You're a great people. And you're very receptive to the word of the Lord. I'm going to say that again. And you're very receptive to the word of the Lord. Some of you still wondering. Idolatry is not what we usually depict. It's not necessarily what we put on a mantle and bow down to. It's, it's actually worse than that. Idolatry is misplaced allegiance. It's, it's contemporary. Contemporary idols are not mantelpieces. They're not necessarily in a room somewhere where you light candles and bow down to them. Nowadays, idolatry is a lot of ideals, a lot of concepts, a lot of things that people accept to be true, put it in practice of their life, and defend it. No matter how wrong it is, no matter how immoral it is, no matter how unbiblical it is, they'll stand in the pulpit and defend their lifestyle because of idolatry, because of what they want to believe and what they want to practice. There's several implications to what Elijah had to address that affects us today. I think Baal worship has permeated our culture. It's permeated our country. There's the Baal of religion who promises anything you believe about God or not, anything you believe about spirituality or not, as long as you're sincere, all roads lead to heaven or to nirvana. It's the Baal of religion. There's the Baal of individuality. 
who says, just be true to yourself, be yourself, become whatever gender you want to be, and all who accept you love you, but all who question you hate you. There's the veil of self-defined morality and choices who allows you to have sex with whoever you want, destroy whoever's in the womb, rob what you want, beat up cops, wipe out nations and people groups, exclude white people from parties and gatherings and job opportunities for DEI, cross borders illegally and, and desire to do whatever you want to do. There's a bale of entitlement who teaches that you can live where you want, whether it's your home or not, take what you want, whether it's yours or not, work, work, work or not work, and get paid. The worship of the bale of entitlement tells you no matter what the rules are at the school, what the dress code is, you can wear whatever you want. The worship of the bale of entitlement says whenever your employer says you need to be at the office to work, the bale of entitlement says, I can work from home. When you worship the bale of entitlement, the government ought to feed you, house you, and pay you even if you don't work. Now, I wish this message was only to the world. And, and maybe I should say this. If this is your first time here, <laughs> I want to apologize because I'm like this all the time. So, Christians have fallen to the, the Baal worship, the Baal of the God, my way. The God that answers the prayers that I want, the God that does the miracles that I want, the God that fixes problems the way that I want them fixed, and the God that gives me what I want, when I want it, and how I want it. And in the USA, what I see happening every day under our country's leadership is no different than what I see with Ahab and Jezebel. It's no different. The difference is the leadership of Ahab and Jezebel led the people into this and almost forced them to do it. If they didn't do it, they could have lost their life, like we see with Daniel, and we can go on even through the books of Kings. The difference there, they lead people into it, force them into it. In America, we vote for it. We vote for it. Ahab led the people to worship Moloch, who was the god that wanted sacrifice of children. In America, we vote for people who support, propagate, and encourage killing children in the womb. Ahab led the people into sexual perversion. In America, we vote for people who normalize sexual perversion and homosexuality. Ahab led the prophets into cutting themselves. In America, we vote for people who approve of the mutilation of people and children so they can change their sex gender. Ahab led people into accepting leaders from foreign nations, which was against the laws of God. In America, we put people in the Senate who tells us that their loyalty is not to America, but to the country that they came from, and who tells us borders ought to be open. We vote for it. Ahab was the king by default from his father. In America, we vote for people who set out to destroy the land of the free and the home of the brave. I got one statement for them, and you'll see it on the screen. Claiming to be wise, instead they're utter fools. Now to my sermon. Because here comes Elijah. Elijah steps into this, and he's a prophet that confronts it. Not for Elijah's sake, but for righteousness' sake for biblical truth's sake, for the nation's sake, for the people's sake. The only time you see God sending a prophet is when the nation is marked with declin uh, declension. They're, de they're declining and a departure from the people of the ways of God. As long 
as Israel walked in obedience and in fellowship of the Lord and worshiped him. There was no prophet. But then there was a time in Judges where it says there was no king in Israel. Every man did was right in his own eyes. Then Samuel is sent. And following that, he raised up prophets to speak to the people who said that they were people of God, under God, to speak to them in a manner to awaken them to the truth and the departure of where they've become. The New Testament is really clear on the purpose of prophets coming. Second Peter 1.19 says, we also have the prophetic word strongly confirmed, and you will do well to pay attention to it. So Peter is pointing back to the prophets and says, listen, their word was confirmed. Pay attention to it. Why? Because it's a lamp shining in dark places until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. That was the purpose of the prophet. The mission, message, the mission and the message of every prophet, and certainly we're talking about Elijah, was to arouse people out of slumbering, to get their conscience awakened to truth. There was the idea, of course, of comforting their hearts, but to keep the people from going into ruin. They, they, they first did this with the faithful, faithful application of the word. They reminded them of what God's way was, what God's purpose was, what God's will was. They spoke into the existing conditions. They didn't sit back and say, maybe one of these days it'll get better. Why don't we just continue just to accept everything and and let God sort it out in the end. No, no, no. They came in and addressed it. They were uncompromising. They called people to repentance. They demanded that people forsake their sin and return to the Lord. They followed that up by directing the eyes of the saints of God, the people who knew truth, who embraced truth, to look up, fix their eyes on the future glory of the Lord. Here we have Elijah in verse number one, and there's really not much that we know about him. It's kind of an abrupt statement. We see these seven bad kings, and then boom, verse one says, now Elijah goes to Ahab, and he says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Elijah comes in in a very abrupt manner. Nothing is recorded about him before this. Nothing about his parenting or his parents, his lineage. We know he's from Gilead. Don't know exactly what part uh, of Gilead, but, but his name means the Lord is God, which gives you kind of the punchline of what his mission is. He's there to remind people the Lord is God, not Baal, not your ideas, not your concepts, not your beliefs, not your twisting of Scripture. The Lord is God. He reminds them of that. And he calls people back to the true God, the one true God. Actually, if you read all of the chapters that Elijah's in, which is 17 through 19, picks back up in 21, and then in the first two of 2 Kings, it's almost like his whole mission is to remind people of who the real God is. Chapter 18, of course, is the, is the battle of Mount Carmel where the people have to make a decision. He confronts the clarity of their confusion. You're confused. If you think it's okay to do this, this, and this, worship Baal, have things the way that you want it, and yet say, God is my God. He says, no, you're in confusion. He deals with that clarity of confusion. That seems to be the primary scene of his life, and it seems like everything either spins around that or leads to that. But Elijah, to me, is dress, addressing a, a world and a society that's really no different than ours. But, but here's what's encouraging to me. When God wanted to do something about a situation, he didn't raise up an army. He raised up one man. God can bring truth by one man and one woman. And I still believe God can do that. 
that God wants people today who are not afraid to tell truth, not afraid to speak into the face of things that are absolutely wrong. People that have enough courage, have enough faith in God, enough love for people, enough love for the truth to speak what is right and what is true, no matter the cost, no matter the cost. I believe God wants to raise up Elijah's in this day among you, among your circle of friends, in your workplace, in your family, business leaders that are willing to stand up and say, no, we got to do things with integrity within our organization. We're not going to be corrupt. Teenagers that will stand for purity on their campuses or politicians or school board members who will do what's right, do things that are moral. You, you can see it throughout the scripture. It seems like so often God called one man or one woman. Moses, when Pharaoh was abusing the people of God, there was no Israeli army. They were all in bondage in Egypt. And God goes and gets one man that's just feeding his sheep on the backside of a mountain that hadn't been in the country for 40 years and calls him to say, I need you to go, and I need you to tell that man he's abusing my people, and he better let my people go. He calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was one of the most evil, wicked places on the planet. They were steeped in evil. And he calls Jonah and tells him, basically, you tell them they turn or they burn. He called John the Baptist when the nation was still under oppression. And he calls him to go tell the religious leaders, you think the problem is the Roman leadership, but the real problem here is the religious leaders who are keeping people from seeing the Messiah that is to come and you need to repent. And throughout the scripture, we see the good news of this, and I think it's the same for 2000. 24 in America, God has never left himself without a witness on the earth. He's never left himself without a witness. In the darkest seasons of human history, the Lord has raised up people and maintained them and sustained them that their testimony would be true unto the word of the Almighty God. Persecution couldn't destroy it, corruption couldn't destroy them. There was always a witness. And we see it here in 1 Kings chapter 17, and it, it'll go on into 18 and 19. The Bible says that Elijah was a man just like us, meaning same nature. Elijah wasn't no superhuman being. He didn't have no S on his chest. He didn't come flying down with a cape. Now, he flew out of here, which is interesting. Uh, he flew out, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but he didn't come flying in uh, on no cape. He was just a person just like you and I that heard what God told him to do, obeyed it without compromise, knowing he was dealing with the most evil leadership that the nation had known. And courageously, he addressed it. And how, why, well, I guess I'll say it this way. What are the elements of Elijah's fearlessness and his courage? What, what do we see of him that caused him to be the man that he was, which is the same elements that I think can be of you and I? The first one was this. He was a person of prayer. We spent weeks on that, and, and I do want to tell you as a church, I was sharing with my intercessors last night that I... I really sense a real, a real revival among our congregation. I really do. It, it's, 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 it's not one that we're going to put a billboard out and flash in lights and direct everybody this way. But there's a revival brewing in this congregation and there's a revival stirring in your hearts. You're changing. You're better. I don't know what your husband says about you or your wife, but you're better. You're getting better. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm, I'm better. 
And I think it's because of prayer. I think it's about, Augie, Augie, you ain't, don't convince her now. We'll, we'll deal with that later. Sorry. I know you were going on into sentences and all that. We, you're better. Lori, he's better. But, but, but with fasting, with, with, uh, with prayer, you're embracing the word. You're becoming people that are intentional about wanting to be better in your home and better in your marriage and better in your household. We got young people, almost 100 young people that gather here on Wednesday night that are pursuing to be better, not become part of the statistics, not, not to become part of the, the ones that we read about on the news. You, there, there's a real, we, we've had healings, remarkable healings, salvations every week, baptisms every week. God is doing some amazing things, and I absolutely know it's because we're becoming a people of prayer. It's because you're becoming a people of prayer. Elijah 5, 17 says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Listen to the courage of this guy. Now, there's a reason why he did that, and I'll address that in just a moment. But he told them that it wasn't going to rain for for three years, but for six months even prior to that, Elijah began to pray, don't let it rain. Don't let it rain. This is what I know about prayer. It gives us courage. Prayer accesses power. More prayer, more power. Little prayer, little power. You want to be more powerful in your life and for God? More prayer. Y'all with me? Prayer gives us courage. Prayer gives us power. Prayer increases faith. Prayer inspires hope. Elijah began to pray six months before he even went to Ahab. I think it was because he was engaging with God, increasing his his courage, increasing uh, his faith, and then go tells the king, it ain't going to rain. Now, now, why did he do that? Well, that's that second thing, because he had a knowledge of God. See, he had a knowledge of God. See, this is what Elijah knows that oftentimes we want to shun away from. Elijah knows that when people turn away from God and don't live in line with the promises and the covenant that they have with God, that God brings judgment. We don't like to talk about judgment on the earth. We don't like to talk about it because we want to say, well, it could have just been Mother Nature. Mother who? How about Father God? How about that? Do you know the Scripture says that God takes the lightning in his hand and tells the lightning where to go? God controls the weather. When it's floods, God's doing that. I know y'all don't like to hear that. God is the one that does that. Why? Because God will bring judgment on a people. And can I just tell you this? He has every right to. God has every right to bring a judgment on people. Folks, it's his world. We're not trying to create a world that fits us. God is trying to create a people that fits into him. Y'all doing all right? They prayed for me. (laughs) They prayed for me. And I'm almost done. And I'll get to Jesus in a minute. (laughs) We're getting there. But Elijah had a knowledge of God. And this is what Elijah knew out of Deuteronomy chapter 11. Listen to this. Verse 16 and 17. But be careful. Listen. Don't let your heart be deceived so that you turn away from the Lord and serve and worship other gods. This is in the first five books of the Bible. This is a couple of hundred, mm, I probably need to go a little bit further. This was a time when Moses was leading. It might have been close to 400 years before Elijah was even on the scene. And the Lord said, don't let your heart be deceived and turn away from the Lord. Moses is, is sharing this and serve and worship other gods. Listen, if you do, the Lord's anger will burn against you 
He will shut up the sky and hold back the rain, and the ground will fulfill to produce his crops. Then you will quickly die in that good land the Lord has given you. Elijah knew this was in Deuteronomy. Elijah knew when the people turn away from God, God said, I'm going to bring judgment upon them and shut down the heavens. So Elijah didn't create a judgment. Elijah knew God and knew the word and said, Lord, this condition is so bad that you are a God that said, you'll shut up heavens if this is how the people keep acting. He's a God, he's a man that knew God. Elijah had no doubt how God felt about the sin of the king and the people. And I, I can't hardly wait to get to next week because just think about this. Elijah's saying, shut up the heavens so that there's no rain. And he living in the same place, which means that would have affected him. But he had enough confidence in God to say, if I'm being obedient to declare what the word of the Lord says and there ain't no rain for three years, my God going to take care of me. That's, 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 that's next week. I was going to try to get there this week, but I got stopped right here. This is where I got stopped, just addressing this, this issue. Y'all doing all right? I got 13 more minutes. You better buckle up. So he said, Elijah had no doubt how God felt about the sin of the king and the people. He knew that God would destroy the people if they kept living this way. And he knew the leader would be removed. He knew what God wanted. He knew what God required. Micah the prophet said this in Micah 6, 8, 9. Oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. Listen to this. Fear the Lord if you are wise. His voice calls to everyone. The armies of destruction are coming. The Lord is sending them. Do what is right. Do what is right. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God and fear the Lord. And here's, here's, a, here's a, I guess I would say the third element of Elijah that I think that made him courageous and fearless is he had an absolute allegiance to God. Absolute allegiance. I'm certainly loving that word more so since our staff retreat. But he was, he, he, he just was not intimidated by Ahab. He went to Ahab and he said to him, as sure as my God lives. That was, the emphasis, of course, was my God. He had an allegiance to him. Ahab you're following after Baal. You're setting up Asherah. That, that, that's not our God. My God. As sure as my God lives. As a matter of fact, all of them Baals and Asherah, they're just a bunch of dead gods anyway. They, they just, matter of fact, Paul says they're not even gods at all. They, they have no life. But Jehovah God was a reality to Elijah. He, he realized that I'm living in accountability to the God who created me. That should be the mindset of every one of us. We don't live unto ourselves. We are accountable to the God who created us. There's, there's a reckoning that comes. Everybody here is going to go into judgment. Now, I know I've been at funerals. I provided, presided over funerals where it don't matter how bad the person was, they're in a better place. I, I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble, but that's not biblical. Not everybody's going to heaven. If everybody was getting eternal life with God, then what are we doing here? Because none of this would even matter. Just keep doing whatever you want to do and live the way you do. Because according to this pop, pop psychology, it all ends good for everybody anyway. Then why are we wasting our time? You don't think I got stuff I can be doing on Sunday morning? I got 275 trees over there. <laughs> Citrus and cats running around. 
There's stuff I could be doing. Tesla's sitting up there waiting at the gate, waiting for us to come back home right now. Listen, we're wasting our time if we don't believe that there is a real reckoning that God has for every one of our life. You can't just live any way, and at the end of the day, God says, well done. No. No. We have to be accountable to God. And your God, the God that you say, that you've committed to, that you love, and that you serve, he wants you to live a life unto him according to his word. It's really that simple. It's, it's, it's not a, an alternative like, okay, if we don't like the way God wants us to live, we can just choose another one. No, no, it's not an alternative. It's not an optional thing. You said you're giving your life to Jesus Christ and that you're following him. You said that when you made a confession of faith. You said that when you took communion. You said, my life belongs to the Lord. If it belongs to the Lord, let's be absolutely surrendered to him and let his word, his truth, his principles, his morals, his values be what guides our life and not the culture, not some ragtag preacher who wants to make up some stuff just so he can do the lifestyle that he wants to live. Some of the most ridiculous mess I'd ever heard when I saw that. Couldn't hardly sleep when I first saw it. I thought, this is, this is the kind of stuff that people go to the church to hear the word of God, and people just make up stuff to support their lifestyle and want people to buy into it. No, no, no. You do what your God teaches you to do. Listen, if you find anything I'm teaching that's wrong, ignore me. Here is the authority of our life. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. We don't have options. And so, a team, you come on. I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a bad mood, but I'm going to get nice right now in a minute. So, come on and get the music and get the room feeling good and everything. I'm ready to wrap this up. I... I, I I absolutely know we're living in a nation that's suffering just like Israel. We're living in a nation that's enduring some of the same stuff that Elijah had to confront. We cannot save the whole nation, but we can save some. And we're needed to do so, not the compromising, let's just love them and not offend type Christian. We really do need the spirit of Elijah. I'm not telling you to walk into a room and see a bunch of sinners and declare to them, hey, just want you to know I'm a man of God. It ain't going to rain. No, no, no. Don't, don't, don't make a fool of you. They'll be calling me, Pastor Tyrone, we got one of your members down here <laughs> losing their mind. <laughs> you know, sitting up here dressed, eating locusts and honey and walking around here with <laughs> camel skin talking about he Elijah. And you told him to be Elijah. No, no, don't misunderstand me. But I do need you to be fearless. I need you to be courageous. I need you to be people that's concerned about people. Have a burden for people. When people are doing things and making decisions that's harming their life, have a burden for people. Have enough love for them to speak to them and say, that's not a good choice for your life. That's not a good action. That's not a good step. That's going to harm you. That's going to harm your marriage. That's going to harm your children. Have a burden for people. Have enough love that you've got the courage to say, can I just talk to you about that decision, about that action? And let me tell you what's right. As a matter of fact, let me tell you who is right. And the one who is right is Jesus. He's right. Jesus needs us. He needs you. Oftentimes I think about that cult when Jesus was preparing to go into Jerusalem. 
coat was just tied in front of the home of his master. And Jesus said, I need you to go get that coat because I have need of him. God is saying, I need you. I, I need you. People are confused. People are fearful. People are lost. The Lord needs us. Not to be the, the sheltering, hiding, holy huddle Christians, abiding our time somewhere, waiting for the return of the Lord. Life is short. Eternity is real. And people matter most. I'm going to say that one more time. Life is short. Eternity is real. And people matter most. We're not, we don't have to be Elijah. Christ is not asking us to do miracles. You might do one, but he's not asking you to do that. He ain't asking you to raise somebody from the dead like Elijah did. He ain't asking you to call down fire like Elijah did. He's just asking you to know the truth, live out the truth, and help people find the truth. That's our mission, is to help those that are far from God find life in Christ. Far from God finding life in Christ. If they can find life any other way, then again, we're wasting our time. The only way to find life is in Christ. I'm going to close out with this verse. Is it too late to pivot and do the doxology instead? Okay. I think I just want to do the doxology today. Um, John 14. I've taken you over time. I'm so sorry. You all right? I just need to read this. John 14, 6, 15 through 21. Jesus told him, listen to this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, talking about the Holy Spirit, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Since I live, you also will live. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. There it is. Because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Everybody stand, if you would. I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to close out with the doxology. The prayer team is here, of course. If you need prayer for anything, they're going to pray. They'll, they'll be here to pray for you. So, team, come on up. I'm going to pray for courage. I'm going to pray for us to be fearless. I'm going to pray for us, the people that have a burden, for the people that we're surrounded by, the people that we love, people in our schools, people in our homes, people on our neighborhood, people in our, on our block, people that we work with, leaders, political leaders, we have a burden for them. Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share your word. Lord, I absolutely am very much aware some of what was shared to some might be might hit them in a in a harsh manner maybe a crude manner certainly in an unsuspecting manner but Lord I as I pray all the time any words that are not truth I subject myself to judgment by you those that are truth those words that are truth Father, let the, that truth prevail in the hearts and the minds of those who have heard it. Lord, I pray for us that we would respond to that word. As Jesus says, if we are people that love you, then we are to obey you. And you've promised to be with us. You promised to be in us. You promised never to abandon us. So I pray, Lord God, 
knowing that you are God that keeps your word and promise. Let us be people of courage. Let us be people that are fearless. Let us be people of the word. Let us be people that speak your truth. Let us have a burden for people that they may hear the ever-saving, the ever-redeeming word of the Lord, that their life may be changed and transformed, that we can have an impact in households, we can have an impact in neighborhoods, we can have an impact, Lord God, in cities, in counties, in states, and in this great land in which we live. Lord, we love and we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you.